All right. Um, so let's pray and then we'll get started. Thank you all for being here again. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you that your mercies are new every morning and therefore we are not consumed. We thank you that though you are a God on high, you have stooped down to us to reveal yourself to us through your word. We thank you that you have entered into covenants with us and that through your beloved son and by his obedience and death you have guaranteed every promise for us yes and amen through him we ask that you would by your spirit illumine us and illumine your word this evening as we seek to understand uh, more clearly more faithfully how you have revealed yourself to us through the various covenants in scripture and we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. All right. So uh, tonight is our second night looking at covenant theology. Last time we introduced covenant and we talked about the first covenant that God makes in Scripture with human beings, uh, what is often called the covenant of works, God's covenant with Adam in the garden. You remember... Uh, Leviticus 26.12 in some ways summarizes the essence of what a covenant is. I will be your God. You will be my people. Uh, we looked at a definition from uh, Gordon Hugenberger who defined a covenant as a relationship between non-relatives that has mutual obligations on each side. Well, what we want to do this week and next time is look at the covenants, the historical covenants that God enters into with human beings after the fall. We're going to look at what uh, we call the covenant of grace, how God graciously works to redeem a people for himself and look at the various blessings that he's promised to them and how Christ ultimately fulfills them. Now, how many of you have made the drive from Orlando up to Jacksonville, Savannah on I-95? probably everyone in this room. Now, I don't know how you go because it really depends how you go, but if you go out 50 and you get on 95 there, which... Let me have this one. This one? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. We're good? All right. If you go out 50, you get on 95. Uh, you start heading up 10, 15 minutes. There's a big sign on the side of the road, and in, it's a yellow sign. You can't miss it. Big black letters. It says, Jesus is the answer. Have you seen this? Right? And around it, it's got a bunch of little words like, you know, lonely or lost or whatever else. But in the middle, it's Jesus is the answer. And from one perspective, we'd all want to say, amen. Right? Jesus is the answer. But... On another level, the, the, the professor in me wants to ask, to what question is Jesus the answer, right? Because you could turn on uh, Christian cable, and you could find uh, many people saying Jesus is the answer, and they'll say Jesus is the answer to your money problems, right? If you just have enough faith, Jesus will make you rich. Or you might find someone saying Jesus is the answer to your health problems. If you just believe enough, right, Jesus will heal your illness. And the problem is, these preachers, these television preachers, they may be saying Jesus a lot, and they may be saying Jesus and answer a lot, but they're actually not preaching the Jesus of the Bible, right? And so, when we say Jesus is the answer, it's very important to understand to what question, right? Well, in a sense, that's what covenant theology does for us. It helps us to understand the framework, it helps us to understand the question to which Jesus is the answer. Well, tonight I want to look at the covenant of grace, God's covenant with human beings after the fall of Adam, and specifically focus on the covenant of grace as it unfolds in the Old Testament through various covenants, first with Abraham, then through Moses with Israel, then with David, and then ultimately in what Jeremiah and other prophets call the new covenant or the everlasting covenant. And what 
this will do is help us to have a better sense of the question to which Jesus in the gospel is the answer. And the next time we'll look at Jesus in the New Covenant within the context of the New Testament. Now, uh, one way of thinking about what we want to do tonight is essentially we're going to put on our trifocal lenses. Okay? First, we want to focus really, really closely on the Abrahamic covenant and talk about various promises that come along in the Abrahamic covenant. And when we say Abrahamic covenant, that's really shorthand for the covenant that God makes with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's really what kind of occupies much of the book of Genesis. Then we're going to broaden our perspective a little bit and look how God's covenant promises to Abraham are further realized in his covenants with Moses and David, or with Israel through Moses and David. And then we're going to go to a wide angle lens and see how all of these are ultimately heading towards what, again, Jeremiah calls the new covenant, what Ezekiel calls the everlasting covenant. And hopefully these three different perspectives, a, a focused perspective, a broader perspective and a wide angle lens will give us a better sense of how Jesus is the answer to the covenant storyline of scripture. All right, if you have your Bibles, we're going to start looking at the Abrahamic covenant. And I hope what we're going to see in each instance, first with Abraham, but then with the broader uh, covenants of, with Moses, David, and the new, is that it's really an understanding the various themes of covenant theology that we more fully understand the message of Scripture, okay? that we really understand what the story is about. Uh, J.I. Packer says somewhere that uh, covenant theology in Scripture is like when you're looking at a globe, and you know how it says in very big, broad letters, Pacific Ocean. He said you can look at the globe and not even see the word written there, and so you focus, and, and then you're, all of a sudden you realize, oh, it's right there in front of my face. That's how covenant theology is in Scripture. And what I want us to see is while we look at these various covenants, when we, when we alert ourselves to the, the themes of the covenant in Scripture, it really does open the Bible and help us to see what's going on. So first, the Abrahamic covenant, and I want us to look at Genesis chapter 12, uh, the first nine verses. Let me read those. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak at Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. Now, there are six, seven, eight themes in these nine verses that are related to the covenant work that God is doing for Abraham and through Abraham. And in a sense, the seven or eight themes that are inter introduced in these nine verses will be with us for the rest of Scripture. Okay? Uh, the book of Genesis is called Genesis because it's the book of beginnings. Okay? It's the seed book that, that all other themes in Scripture grow out of. Well, in a more focused sense, you might say all the themes of the covenant of grace are planted in Genesis 12. And in some ways, in earlier chapters as well. But we see them in a very pronounced and, and focused way here. And, and, and reading the rest of Abraham's story, but then through the Mosaic Covenant, the Davidic Covenant, and the New Covenant, and so forth, we see those, those themes grow 
and, and flourish. And we see, we see new dimensions added to each theme along the way. So I just want to point out a few of those themes. And I was going to do a little bingo card for you to kind of find the themes, but I, I ran out of time. So the first theme I want you to notice is the theme of divine initiative. And this is in Genesis 12, 1 and 3. The Lord said to Abram, okay, this is God's idea. Now, in verses 1, 2, and 3 of Genesis uh, 12, you have a five-fold repetition of the word blessing. Okay? And look at it. You see it. Uh, I will bless you. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and who, who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So do you think that's a theme that the author wants to emphasize? Yes. Well, the reason that is a fascinating emphasis in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, is because between Genesis chapter 3 and Genesis chapter 11, there's another term that's been repeated five times. Anybody know what it is? Curse. Okay, beginning in the garden with the fall, and then throughout the subsequent chapters, we've got the flood with Noah, various other things, God pronounces curses five times. What do you think the significance of that is? Well, what we have in Genesis 12 is something new. But specifically, God is initiating something. God is beginning something which is reversing and overturning and overruling the curses that have fall upon, fallen upon creation. And that's why we call it a covenant of grace. It's very interesting. Uh, later passages of scripture, and then later in Judaism, uh, folks often look back to this initial moment of God graciously calling Abraham. And what you see is that the way that later scriptures look back at this is sometimes different from the way later Judaism looks back at this. So, in Joshua chapter uh, 24, verse 2, Joshua is recounting God's call of Abraham. And one thing he says, very interestingly, is that Abraham came from a family of idolaters. In other words, it's not that Abra he looked down and he saw Abraham and he said, wow, this is a guy I could really make something of. Okay? He's just one of the many who have forsaken God who are bowing down to idols, and yet God in his mercy says, you know what? I'm going to do something good and gracious with Abraham and through Abraham, and he calls Abraham. See, what's fascinating is that there is a, a, a text in later Judaism which looks back and it tells the story this way. One day Abraham was out in his father's field, and he was working for him, and he came up to a rock and he realized, oh, this is the rock that my dad used to make our household idols. And then he got to thinking, he said, well, that's kind of silly. The same rock that my dad used to make our household idols is the one that he uses to build a bench or whatever. That's silly that we would bow down to something that is cut out of a rock. And he becomes the first monotheist. And then God comes to him and says, I want you on my team. Do you see what a different perspective this is? Okay, this later Jewish text says, there's something about Abraham that made him stand out from everyone else, and God came to him because of that. But that's not the perspective of Genesis 12, and that's not the perspective of Scripture. This is a world that stands under God's curse, but God initiates something new. A fivefold curse is going to be overturned through a fivefold blessing. The second thing I want to note, and we'll, I'll be really quickly with this one, place. The call is to go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. It's described later, and I'll come back to this in a moment, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, as the land that God was going to give Abraham as an inheritance. Next theme, relation. Now, we've talked about this already. The essence of a covenant is a relationship. Well, already in Genesis chapter 12, we see something about the character of the relationship between God and Abraham, and indeed with Abraham's offspring. And to understand it, we have to realize this kind of contrast between where Abraham's coming from and where Abraham is heading. Where, where, where is Abraham leaving? His father's house. Now, 
I've got an 18 year old and I'll try not to tear up when I talk about it. My oldest is uh, right now making plans to go away to college. And in our culture, we say, great, right? She's going to move out. She's going to get a dorm. She's going to, OK, let's not talk about it anymore. <laughs> I told you I didn't want to go there. OK. And we say, that's great, right? Opportunity. What will she major in? What will she do? Who will she meet? Ooh. OK, <laughs> we're not going to talk about it. But see, that's not how this call would be viewed in the ancient world. Okay, the call to leave your father's house was not an exciting thing. Okay, the call to leave your father's house in the ancient world would be like, um, let's talk about your, your, your Roth IRA. It'd be like God telling you, empty it. It'd be like God telling you, quit your job. It'd be like God telling you, give your house away. Why? Because in the ancient world, your future hung on your family. Okay? In the ancient world, there's no idea of like leaving your father's house and going starting a new business. Okay? If, if dad's a baker, guess what you are? A baker. Right? If dad's a butcher, guess what you are? A butcher. If dad's a candle, but it's a candlestick maker, you, you get the point. So the call to leave your father's house is, is basically say, trust me for the future. Okay? Leave all security behind you. But the positive side is this. Leave your country, leave your father's house, go to the land which I will give you. Well, in that call, already we see something about the relationship that God is taking to Abraham. And here's what it is. In the ancient world, where do you get your land from? You get it from dad, right? And what do we call that? An inheritance. You see, this is exactly how Hebrews 11 reads this passage. Going to the land that God was going to give him as an inheritance. So what's the relationship that God is assuming? He's assuming the relationship of a father to Abraham. And so listen to this. In Exodus chapter 4, you remember the very first message that God gives Moses to tell Pharaoh? The very first thing on his lips. Israel is my what? Firstborn son. Which means what in the ancient world? My heir. Let him go that he may serve me. So what we have is not only a divine initiative, not only a promise of land, but we have the, the, the entrance into a relationship where God is assuming the relationship of a father and Abraham and his offspring are being adopted into a relationship of children. We've got the promise of a people down in verse 7. To your offspring I'll give this land. We'll come back to that in a moment. A very important theme. Okay, we've got a promise of mediation. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. See, God's blessing Abraham, but God's purpose to bless Abraham is not just about Abraham. Through Abraham, God's going to bless all the families of the earth. Then we've got, uh, and this is a little bit harder to see, but it's, I, th I think, clearly what's going on here. We've got a royal promise. And we'll come back to this later, where God promises to uh, make him a great nation. And he promises to make his name great. Nationhood and reputation. In the ancient world, these things are associated with kingship. And so already implicitly, there, there is some kind of royal promise in, in this, this call to Abraham. We'll see how that develops in a moment. But then there's also something here in terms of a priestly theme. And this is what we see in the last few verses. The conclusion of God's call to Abraham is that what? Abraham builds an altar and he calls upon the name of the Lord. Now, we associate altars with what? Holy places, places of worship. Okay? We, who officiates at an altar? Who, 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 priests. And so what we see, and again, we think back to the garden. The, the very first challenge that the serpent made in the garden was not to God's word. The first thing he said to, to Eve was not God's line, you're not going to die. The first challenge he made was to God's character, to God's name. Well, when you see that, you realize the nature of the reversal that's happening in the call to Abraham. What's the result of God's call to Abraham? 
he calls on the name of the Lord. He's honoring the name of the Lord. He's worshiping the Lord. And this is the goal of all God's covenant dealings with his people. Right? What does the shorter catechism say? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And so what we see in the call of Abraham is, is human beings are being set back on the right path in terms of their relationship to God. As a result of God's gracious initiative, he's restoring them to a priestly vocation as well as a royal one. All right, we've got to move quickly. So flip ahead to Genesis 15. Now, Genesis 15 comes after Genesis 14. But you didn't know that before you came tonight. Verse 1 says, after these things. Now, after what things? Well, after the things that happened in Genesis 14. What happened in Genesis 14? Remember Lot was kidnapped? And so Abraham got his 318 servants, and they went out and rescued Lot. In the course of rescuing Lot, there's this big battle. And Abraham and his servants, they win the battle. And I don't know if you remember, at the end of the battle, some of the kings who were on the side uh, that won as a result of Abraham's victory, they wanted to give him some of the spoils of the battle, right? And Abraham said, I won't take them. And you remember why he said he wouldn't take them? Because I've raised my hand to God most high, maker of heaven and earth, possessor of heaven and earth, right? And I won't be enriched by you, I'll be enriched by God. Well, that's the context for after these things. Well, so after these things, the Lord appears to Abram again. And he says in verse 1, Fear not, Abram, I'm your shield, your reward shall be very great. Now, why fear not? Well, again, we think, oh, well, yeah, why fear not? A Abram just won this battle. Well, let me ask you this, right? If, if, if you face a bully every day on the playground, right, and he steals your, your milk money or whatever, let's say one day you, you kind of, you work up enough strength and, 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 and you don't put up with it, right? And, and, and you take his milk money. Next day, when you got on the playground, are you, are you not worried about the bully anymore? No, right? Because what's the bully going to want? He's going to want revenge, right? And the same thing with Abram. The fact that he's won one battle doesn't mean, okay, I'm good. Right? In fact, he's, he's kind of made himself obnoxious to all the, those ancient kings right, that he defeated. And so God comes to him and says, fear not. I'm your shield. I'm going to protect you. And your reward is going to be great. And interesting there, the term for reward is, is, is a term that can be used for, for basically the spoils you would get in a battle. Remember, Abraham has just rejected the spoils from, from these kings. And so God is saying, I'm going to reward you greatly. Now, it's just this occasion which causes Abraham to ask a question. And here's where covenant theology helps us to make sense of what's going on. Abraham basically asks two questions in Genesis 15. And they both have to do with things that God has already promised. People and place. So Abram essentially says this. Um, Lord, about that reward thing. Okay, While we're on the topic, you know how a while back you mentioned the promise of offspring? Yeah, I don't have any. And so at this time, old man that I am, I've got one foot in the grave. He basically uses an idiom. He says, I'm, I'm dying here. It's going to be Eliezer of Damascus, one of my servants who's going to inherit everything. And so what's going on? And then he says, and, and about the land promise. You know, I I'm still don't own one square inch of the land you promised to me. And so he, he puts both of these questions to God. And here's the thing about it. This passage does not look down on Abraham for asking questions like that to God. You know why? Because God had promised to give these things to him. And Abraham doesn't see him. And so he says, God, I don't understand. So what's beautiful about this passage is that God then responds to these very specific questions about where's the people, where's the seed, where's the offspring, and where's the land. And you remember how he responds, first with respect to the question of the seed. He says, you see all the stars in the heaven? So shall your descendants be. And I think God there is referring, we're appealing back to Genesis chapter 1. And what are you doing from Genesis chapter 1? That God, by his sovereign word, filled the heaven with stars. He just spoke, and it happened. And essentially what he's telling to Abraham is, look, 
The same word that called all these things into existence out of nothing is the one that has promised offspring to you. And so you can bank on it. It's going to happen. Nothing can stop it because nothing can stop God's word. And then he says, look as far as you can, east, west, north, and south. You see, as far as the eye can see, guess what? All of this land I'm going to give to you. And he performs this interesting thing. In Genesis 15, it, it, it says he takes some animals, he tears them in two. It, there's this description of a torch passing between the, the torn parts of the animals. And again, he repeats the promise he'd already made. To your offspring, I will give this land. Now, this, this action that the Lord performs here, it's called a self-maledictory oath. What is malediction? Diction, word, mali, bad. Self-maledictory oath, pronouncing something bad on yourself. And essentially the meaning of a self-maledictory oath is in the torn animals. It's let what happened to these animals happen to me if I don't keep my promise. And so what the Lord says is, the response to your question about the people the response to your question about the place is not, only is, not only am I able to do it, right? The same word that called all these stars into existence is the one that made the promise, and therefore that certainly will fulfill it. Not only am I able to do it, but I'm also willing to do it. And, and, and may all that has happened to the animals happen to me if I don't. And then right there at the center of Genesis 15, you've got a statement that the New Testament loves to quote. Paul quotes it. James quotes it. You remember what it is? Abraham believed God, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Now, what we see here is not only we have the theme of place and people re-emphasized and confirmed in the face of doubt, we have the theme of divine initiative confirmed as well. Because here's the thing. In the ancient world, self-maledictory oaths are very common. But usually what happens is the stronger king makes the weaker king take one upon himself. If you don't do what I've told you to do, pronounce a curse on yourself. But what happens in Genesis 15 is the one who started this thing, who, who brought a promise of blessing to a world under a curse in Father Abraham, he says, the guarantee that it's going to happen is me and only me. I'm going to bring it to pass. And so we see that God confirms the graciousness of his covenant relationship with Abraham and his offspring. He will make it happen. All right. Now, there's one more thing here, and I just want to note. There's a theme that's introduced in, in Genesis 15. At the very end of the chapter, he says, before you get this land I've promised, your people are going to go down, and they're going to be slaves. And, and, and a cruel people is going to oppress them. And then after 400 years, I'm going to bring them out. What you have in Genesis 15 is a promise of future slavery followed by a redemption. What you have in Genesis 15 is the first mention of the Exodus, which is going to be so important for the Mosaic Covenant. So we'll come back to that in a moment. Now, Genesis 17. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. When Abram was 99 years old, Genesis 17, 1, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, his covenant name. Walk before me and be blameless. Now, you've got several things going on in Genesis 17. One thing is you've got a, a, a kind of new emphasis on the obedience that God is requiring of Abram. Now, it's not that God hasn't required obedience already, because what do you see in Genesis 12? Leave your father's house, and what did Abraham do? He did it. Okay, this was, this was the Lord's take up your cross and follow me to Abraham. And Abraham did it. Okay? But what we have is, if you remember Genesis 16, there's a little bit of a, an iffy thing going on. There's still no seed, and so Abraham and Sagar, they, they try to, I'm uh, sorry, Abraham and Sarah, Sagar, that's like Van Halen, Van Hagar, Sagar. Okay, uh, some of you know that, we'll get that joke. Uh, 
they tried to work things out. And, and so God's having to say, look, no, 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 no. Remember, I promised, I've guaranteed all of these things. You don't try to take it in your own hands. Don't try to make it happen yourself. Trust me. And the, and, the, and the exhibition of your trust is what? Walk before me and be blameless. Now, here's what I want you to notice in Genesis 17. There's a number of things going on here that are very, very important for covenant theology. But one of them which is so important is this. Where, what is the relationship between human obedience and that divine initiative of grace? Is it walk before me and be blameless and I'll do all these good things for you? No. It's coming to an idolater. I'm going to do all these good things for you. Therefore, walk before me and be blameless. Now, there's a sense in which that's one of the most important lessons of the Christian life, isn't it? Right? It, it's not that we do our best and then God will crown it with grace. It's what? God is gracious toward sinners. And then he calls those to whom he has made promises and confirmed promises to respond to those promises with a life of obedience. Well, what you see is, is that the, the order here is vital to understanding covenant theology. I'll mention another uh, later Jewish text. There's a Jewish text that refers to Genesis 15, 6, which I mentioned a moment ago. Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. This Jewish text says like this. Abraham was reckoned as righteous when he offered up Isaac and, rever and showed his reverence, his fear of God. Now, what chapter in the book of Genesis did Abraham offer up Isaac? 22, right? How, how, how does this Jewish text read what's going on? The order's backwards, right? Abraham demonstrated his fear of the Lord, and therefore God declared him righteous. That's actually not what happened, right? God declared righteous, as Paul says in Romans 4, the one who was ungodly, the one who had no right to the blessing, okay? But then he called the one he declared righteous by grace alone to walk in obedience, to walk in gratitude. Everything hangs on the difference, right? It's the logic of Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, right? By grace you are saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But then what? We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So we see this already in, in, in the Abrahamic covenant. And here's the thing. The reason Paul keeps coming back to this, he does it in Galatians chapter 3, he does it in Romans chapter 4, because here's what he wants to say. If that's how God set things up in that seed covenant, that Genesis covenant with Abraham, then guess what? That's the rules of the game. God doesn't change the rules anywhere else. Okay, whatever role the law is going to play when it comes in later, it can't be that this is the way you're going to make yourself acceptable to God. It has to play another role. And already we see in Abraham's story what that role is. It's how the one who has received God's grace responds in gratitude. Now, Genesis 17 says some other things. It talks about circumcision. Okay, you get a repeated promise about people. You get a repeated promise about place. By the way, you have a repeated promise about people who are not Abram's natural offspring can come into the covenant. Circumcision is not just about Abram's physical offspring. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Um, but you got something very important. I want you to see it in verse 7 and 8. Remember the, the, the verse we started with, Leviticus 26, 12? I will be your God, you will be my people. You have the first instance in Scripture of that covenant formula. In Genesis 17, 7 and 8. The, the, again, this is the, the seed covenant. This is the Genesis covenant. Well, here's the first instance of that covenant. And again, it's, it's describing the relationship. It says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I'll give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And here it is. And I will be their God. First time in scripture that promise is made. I will be their God. Now I ask you, why does it not yet say, and you'll be my people? They're not a people yet. That's exactly right. 
You know the first time the, the word people is used to describe Israel? It's Exodus chapter 1, verse 7. Right now, Abraham doesn't even have a child. Right? It's just Abraham and Sarah and their household. Okay? Even at the concluded book of Genesis, you have 12 tribes, you've got 70 people going down to Egypt, but they're not yet a people in the technical sense. But already, he says, I will be your God, and I'll be God to your offspring after you. And in a sense, this is the, the heart of the covenant of grace. All other covenants, you see this promise repeated in every unfolding covenant in Scripture. All other covenants are about realizing this promise. Now, very quickly, and then we're going to take a little break, uh, I want to mention something in Genesis chapter 22 and Genesis chapter 49. Uh, Genesis chapter 22. This is really the last major scene in Abram's life. What's fascinating about Genesis chapter 22 is it, it, forms, it forms a kind of bookend with Genesis 12. Genesis chapter 12, Abraham leaves his father's house, right? Go to a land that I will show you. Genesis chapter 22, Abraham is dwelling at the southern tip of the promised land. And actually, he's in the most kind of peaceful situation he's known his entire life because he's just made a covenant with Abimelech. They've, they've kind of worked out an arrangement, and, and, and things are going to be relatively okay. Well, God comes to him and says, leave, leave that place and go to Mount Moriah. And now, the place he sends him is not leave your father's house, but what is it? That son, that seed that has come, offer him to me. Now, this is a strange thing, isn't it? What are the two things God has promised Abraham, centrally? People in place. And now, here at the end of Abraham's life, what does he tell him to take leave of? People in place? Well, what does Abraham do? He doesn't. Right? And so, in one of the most dramatic narratives in Scripture, and the narrator is so painstakingly slow in telling the story, he talks about Abraham packing. He talks about the journey. He talks about him telling the servants to wait at the foot of the mountain. He talks about Isaac's question. Right? And in each instance, what he wants to show is that Abraham has left all the kind of second guessing of God behind. He's left, be you know, if this had been Genesis chapter 13, you better be there would have been a flock of lamb, right? A flock of sheep following Abraham up the mountain. I'm going to sacrifice Isaac, but just in case. You change your mind? None of that. And when Isaac asks him, where's, where's the lamb? What does Abraham say? It's a statement of faith. The Lord will provide. And of course, we know what happens, right? Abraham ties Isaac to the altar. He raises his bony hand in the ancient and eastern sky. And he's about to kill Isaac. And then the angel of the Lord calls out, Abram, Abram. And he looks and there's a ram caught in the thicket. And it says that Abraham sacrifices the ram instead of Isaac. Well, then Abraham names the mountain. You remember what he names the mountain? He names it the Lord will provide. And then God makes another promise. And now he says the promise of mediation that was mentioned in Genesis 12, 3, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now he says something that's actually quite profound. He doesn't say in you all the families of the earth will be blessed, but he talks about a seed. And here, the, grammatically, it seems that he's talking about a singular seed, a seed among the seed. In your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And Peter quotes this in Acts 3.25 on his second sermon after Pentecost when he's speaking to his Jewish brothers. And he says, God has raised up Jesus and he is the seed in whom all the nations of the earth, including Jews, are being blessed. And so what we see is that that theme of mediation in Genesis chapter 2 is focused on one of Abram's ancestors. Now, the other thing I want to note here, and this is where things get really fascinating. Remember how we talked about the, the priestly theme in Genesis chapter 12 related to the altar. Genesis chapter 22, 
Abraham's been building altars the whole time. It's like you can't go anywhere where Abraham is not building an altar. He builds an altar again, right? Mount Moriah. What's the significance of Mount Moriah and later biblical theology? It's the Temple Mount. It's where Solomon builds the temple. And, and what's going to happen? And every other firstborn child in a faithful Israelite family, they're going to take him to Jerusalem, present him in the temple like Abraham did Isaac at Moriah. And what has God provided? A sacrifice so you keep your son instead, right? Until one day, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, Luke will tell the story of Mary and Joseph bringing Joseph, Jesus and presenting him in the temple. And it talks about all the things they did in the temple and how they kept the law perfectly and, and they made sacrifices. But you know what sacrifices are mentioned? The ones for Mary, Mary's ritual impurity from childbirth. You know what no sacrifice is mentioned? One for Jesus. Because at last we have a son who's going to be presented on the altar and not be taken off. Well, that theme comes from Genesis 22. Now, Genesis 49, very quickly, very quickly, very quickly. Genesis 49, Jacob is doing what all the patriarchs do when they're about to die. And what do they do? They bless their children, right? The, the, the covenant promises are passed on from one generation to the next. Not only does God meet the patriarchs and repeat the promises, but the fathers repeat them as well to their children. And so Jacob is, is pronouncing his blessing on his sons. And in Genesis chapter 12, you have basically kind of equal amounts of blessing pronounced on each son, except for two sons who get a double amount of blessing. One is Joseph, no surprise there. The story has been about Joseph since Genesis 37. Joseph has been the main character of, of the last part of the book of Genesis. But the other son who gets this double portion of blessing is Judah. And it's a very interesting thing because you think, huh, why, why Judah? And specifically, the blessing that's made concerning Judah is a royal blessing. The scepter shall not depart from Judah or the ruler's staff from between his feet. And that's interesting because way back in Genesis 17, within the context of circumcision, what was implicit in Genesis 12, a great name, great nation, is made explicit because the Lord says kings are going to come forth from you. Well, Judah is identified as the royal seed. And you're thinking, hmm, that, that's a fascinating thing. What's, what's going on here? Well, you remember back to, to Joseph's story. Remember how Joseph's story begins? Right? You kind of get things going. Joseph's talking about his dreams. His brothers are rolling their eyes. Right? And then no sooner have you gotten the Joseph story started, and you get this little interlude in Genesis 38, and it's like a text that chances are you may have never even heard a sermon on because of what happens in Genesis 38. Right? It's kind of like... So Genesis 38, Judah has a son who displeases the Lord, so the Lord strikes him down. In accordance with the practice of Leverite marriage, Judah gives the first son's wife to the next son to raise up offspring. That son does something that the Lord doesn't like. He gets struck down. And so Judah says, hmm, this woman is unlucky in love. And so he tells her, look, um, my next son, he's too young right now, but d don't worry, I'll, I'll give him to you later. And of course he doesn't. And so already we're kind of like, you know, that's kind of a, a weird story. Well, it gets weirder. So after a while, Tamar's like, he ain't going to give me that son. And so you remember what she does. She dresses up like a prostitute. To do what? To trick her father-in-law into sleeping with her. And we're like, this is a crazy story. What's going on here? And so she tricks him. And you remember, things are over, and, and he doesn't have any money because he wasn't planning to visit a prostitute that day, apparently. And so... He leaves his staff with her, and he says, look, I'll send payment later. Here's the pledge. And so uh, as if the story is, is not bad enough, all of a sudden Tamar turns out pregnant. And then we're like, ooh, right. This. We're kind of like, uh, you know, you have to wash your mouth out with soap, or your eyes out with soap, or whatever it is to, to keep reading. Now she's pregnant by her father-in-law, okay? And, 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 and now she's notably pregnant, so they say, 
all right, Judas played the, uh, Tamar's played the harlot, we're going we're gonna to have to execute her. And so they, they, they bring her out, and, and they're gathering around, they're going to stone her, and, 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 and the drama is just at the highest point. And, and Tamar, right before they're kind of about to cast the first stone, she says, by the way, before you do that, uh, you might want to return this staff right here to its rightful owner. And then, as if the story hadn't been weird enough, you remember what Judah says? She was more righteous than I. And we're like, what? <laughs> oh, it's like, but she did the thing, and then the, she's more righteous than I. And then she gives birth, and then it goes back to Joseph, and you're like, okay, back to rated G, right? Even the Potiphar thing now, it's like Potiphar's wife, like, yeah, it's not that bad. PG-13, we've seen some stuff right? We, we can deal with this. They're like, what is going on here? What's happening is the narrator is foreshadowing something. This is what you do when you go to a movie, right? You start off in a scene, then it switches somewhere else, and then you switch back. You never think, oh, that was a stupid editing move. Why did they show me a different character in a storyline over here? You always assume what? They're going to come back to it. And this is what happens in Genesis 38. And so when you get to Genesis 49, and all of a sudden, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, and what? The ruler's staff from between his feet. You say, whoa. The ruler's staff, preserved by Tamar for Judah and Judah's offspring. And what's fascinating about the, the, the statements that are made there of Judah, two images that, that, that really are going to stick with us for the rest of Scripture. <clears throat> One is that he is described as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And you remember in Revelation chapter 5, when John finds out there's no one who's worthy to open the scroll, which is God's plan for history. No one's worthy to, to bring it to pass, and he's weeping. And then one of the elders preaches the gospel. He says, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's overcome. He's able to open the scroll. Okay, well that promise, it goes all the way back to the Abrahamic covenant. Okay, the line of the tribe of Judah, we, we, have any, we don't even know who David is yet, and yet already in the Abrahamic covenant, the seed has been planted. It's Judah's seed. The other fascinating thing that, that, that is said here is not only that he's the line of the tribe of Judah, but the name Judah itself means praise. And he says, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. And indeed, all the Gentiles are going to bring their tribute to you. Why is that a fascinating thing? Well, you remember what the, the restoration of, of, of Abraham and of the human race in Abraham, remember what it climaxes in, in in Genesis chapter 12? What? Abraham worshiping the Lord, calling on the name of the Lord. Now here at the conclusion of Genesis 49, we learn that the seed, who's going to be the one through whom the blessing of all the families of the earth is going to come, he's also going to be one who receives praise from all the families of the earth. And again, think back to Revelation chapter 5. <coughs> Revelation chapter 4, we have the praise of God on the throne. Revelation chapter 5, what do we have? The praise of the Lamb. And the chapter concludes, right, Unto him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and power. Well, already in the Abrahamic covenant, we, 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 the, the author, as it were, said, keep your eye on the ball. Keep your eye on Judah. That's where the blessing is going to come. All right. I want to take a, a quick uh, <clears throat> five-minute break. And... Uh, take some questions so far, and, and then we'll jump back in, talk about Moses, David, and the New Covenant. Questions? Yeah. Uh, 
I think sometimes the question is, 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 is there any significance to the geographical locations of, of Abraham's altars? I think sometimes yes, sometimes no. There's very clearly uh, an attempt to connect the places of worship with later events in Israel's history. I mean, Moriah is the biggest one um, as, as the Temple Mount. Um, I mean, it's interesting. In some ways, yes. Another way, I want to say, there's something about his mobility that's, that's very significant. Uh, you remember how Paul describes the church in Corinth in, 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 in his opening greeting? He, he says uh, to the saints in Corinth, with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord. Now, it's interesting. When you think of the Old Testament and you think of Old Testament worship, what do you usually think about? You think about centralized worship, right? Jerusalem, Temple Mount. And you think of it as after the coming of Christ and the new covenant of, of worship in every place. What's fascinating, though, about the patriarchs is the worship of the patriarchs is actually more like our worship in the sense that it's, it's spread out. Every place where the name the Lord is called upon becomes a holy place, as it were. And so Greg Beale, who's got a very excellent book on this theme called The Temple and the Church's Mission, he actually argues that the, the, the various locations of the altars in, in the book of Genesis is in a sense a, again, reclaiming of the earth for the holiness of God's name. Um, as it had been desecrated in the garden, now we're, we're having. And so in some ways, the significance is, is, is that it's, it's never, again, if you think of Abraham is, is plan A, right? God's plan is all, always to fill the earth with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It was never to be about focused in just one place, Moriah, the Temple Mount, or whatever. And so in some ways, the patriarchal story puts less significance on place than, than even we have in the Mosaic Covenant and Davidic Covenant. But yeah, there, there's, there are a lot of connections to kind of later episodes, and, and, and the author does want to, to, to make note of those. But I, I just counterbalance it with the, there's something about the, the kind of sheer diversity of locations that's also interesting. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, I think they're both, in some ways, uh, the question is the significance of the, uh, the pot and the flaming torch. I think the significance is, if you think of Moriah, I'm oh, no, sorry, if you think of Sinai with the Mosaic Covenant, you remember the Theophany is a divine appearance. Remember the description of God's appearance at Sinai as smoke and fire and everything else. I think actually what we have is a kind of precursor. So I think they both represent the presence of God, the glory of God. Um, and again, it's interesting, he's prophesying the Exodus. And so I think that, I think I'll attach them both to the glory of, of, of the triune God. Yeah. All right, let's take a quick stretch break. Four minutes. Hey, how are you? good, how are you? I'm doing all right, I'm doing Thanks all right. for coming. Glad to be here. Hey, tell me this, is um, the emphasis on place here? Yeah, yeah. You said that's going to tail off some. Yeah. Does that say anything about our sense of place and how we think about that? In what sense? Well, I mean, I do think, and you know, you don't see it in all land because we're so right. transitional. Right. But I do think there is a sense in which we are to be. I mean, scripture says, I don't know if it, I don't know where it is, but you know, it talks about basically bloom where you're planted. Yeah. Build, yeah. Establish right, right, right. Establish yeah. Garden, yeah. Kind of That's right. And so, and I do think there's a, um, in our culture, because we don't put emphasis Yeah, we're on so place. transient. Yeah. yeah. We miss out. That we miss on. Yeah, it's kind of the windowberry kind of thing. Well, yeah, not to the extreme. Yeah, but, but yeah, no, I mean, I think it's, Scripture knows. I mean, place is essential. 
right? Um, because we're, that's the kind of creatures we are. Yeah. We're, we're yeah. creatures of place. That's right. And we couldn't, we couldn't flourish without it. Um, so I do think it, scripture values place in a way that's probably higher than a lot of modern Americans. And yeah, our lives are so spread out everywhere. I mean, right. you've, you've seen all these studies about, you know, it used to be you had your, your church, your, your job, your workplace, I mean, your, your doctor, whatever. It's all same neighborhood. Yeah. And now we're, you're in different places for everyone, which means you're not connected to all the same people and, and yeah 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 and that's yeah place and generation connection yeah. Yeah. those go together well, right that's true. yeah yeah no i mean i just i don't know i just that sense of place and how do you do that yeah it's sort of one of these themes that kind of rolls yeah. over in my mind all the time yeah yeah so, um, I and mean, even when we're i mean we're described as pilgrims right so we're journeying but we are journeying to a place. Yeah. <laughs> so you never get away from place, yeah. right? New heaven and new earth That's is true. place. That's true. Um, well, I, it may not. That's why I didn't ask it. It could have been a rabbit trail, but I just wondered if any of this speaks to that at all. Yeah, I mean, I think it does. I think it's, I mean, the idea of, of a church is it's a gathered people. Right, yeah, you yeah. can't have church apart from place. Right. Um, physical presence matters. Paul, you know, Paul, John, in their letters, they say, "I wish I could tell you face to face, but I'm writing the letter because right. I can't." Right. I mean, right. it's, it's yeah, fascinating, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. So all of these, yeah, there's definitely a value on place in scripture. That that is countercultural. To, to the way we view things. The way much of history, much of the world would have valued in the same way. Uh, or similar ways. Well, I mean, Laura Grace even asked in her lit class, the 10th graders, would any of you consider coming back here and living? Right. And she says most of them are appalled at the idea. I know. No. I know. Um, and she makes them read something from Wendell Berry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, a few years ago, I drove Josiah through Jacksonville or something. Uh -huh. This is where I grew up. So right. I was 22. Right. And I think I must have just hit the age where every single place was like, it was like an emotional oh, yeah, yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it's part of who you are. Right. It's part of your identity. Right. And you lose your identity in a sense if you're... Yeah. Well, you know. I feel it when I go home because I do have that... Yeah. Generational yeah. benefit of right. knowing right. generations of people. Yep. Uh, no, there's something there for sure. So, anyway, this yeah. is great. Good. Hey. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I don't, it's not related to Uh huh. Um, my friend pe preached a sermon. I was listening to it, so I didn't get to ask him. That's why I'm asking. Uh huh. So in the book of Revelations in it, um, it talks about um, how there's no one there to open the scroll. Right. And he was saying there are lots of theories about what the scroll is. And he believes the most plausible theory is that the scroll is the Lamb's book of life, which is why Jesus is the only one that is qualified to open the scroll. Yeah. I wanted to know if you knew, what were the other theories of what the scrolls were? Or what the scrolls that it's it's about God's judgments, so the various kind of judgments that follow in later chapters, or that it's a little bit broader, which is what I think, which is judgment and salvation. It's this purpose for history, okay. kind of more broadly conceived, okay. which would include the redeemed and so right. forth. Okay. Yeah. That was my question. Yeah, it's a good I question. I can't ask him. He's in Romania. Ah, good question. <laughs> All right, let's uh, keep going. Now, uh, what, I, what I want to do is, is quickly move through some things related to the Mosaic and Davidic Covenant and then, and then pause to, to talk about how, how this relates to the New Covenant and how this sets us up for understanding that billboard, Jesus is the answer, but to what question? Um, 
So we, we've got a number of themes here, and we didn't even talk about all of them, or we didn't talk about all of them at much length. The book of Exodus begins with the word and, in Hebrew at least, okay? Because the idea is it's continuing the story. What happens, though, in each of the covenants that follow, while you, in a sense, you have all of these themes addressed in one way or another. So the Mosaic covenant addresses all these themes. Davidic covenant addresses all these themes. New covenant addresses all these themes. What you have, as in any story, is you have certain themes given more prominence than others. Okay? And I want to just mention three that, that are given special prominence within the context of the Mosaic covenant. Okay? If God made promises to Abraham, how does he begin to fulfill them under the Mosaic Covenant? Well, the, the three themes I want to mention are the, the, the theme of slavery and redemption, okay, the theme of human obedience, and then the theme of place. And I want to see how ultimately they're all tied together in, in the theme of relation. So the theme of slavery and redemption, the theme of human obedience, and the theme of place. What's fascinating about this when it comes to the Mosaic Covenant is that really the Mosaic Covenant is with us from Exodus chapter 19 on. Okay? But the book of Exodus is, in terms of its literary structure, it's designed to essentially emphasize these three themes that I've just mentioned. Okay? And so Exodus chapter 1 through 18 are largely devoted to the redemption of a people enslaved in Egypt. And you know all the story about the plagues. You know the story about the Passover. You know the story about Israel coming out of Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, and so forth. Exodus 19 through 24 are largely devoted to formally making the, the Mosaic Covenant but focusing on what is at the heart of the Mosaic Covenant, which is what? The Ten Commandments. Okay? And so the giving of the law. And, and, and this is the, the kind of central expression of the obedience that God requires of his people in, 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 in Scripture. Exodus 19 through 24. How about place? Well, Exodus... Chapters 25 through 40 are largely preoccupied with instructions regarding the what? The tabernacle. Okay? And now we're starting to understand really what the central importance of place is. Okay? Let's put it like this. In Exodus chapter 19, after God has redeemed Israel, he says... You are a royal priesthood. Now, these are themes that we've already heard about in the Abrahamic Covenant, and actually, they're already in Genesis 1 and 2 as well. But again, they're, they're, they're made in a more pronounced way. Well, where does a priestly people serve? In God's presence, right? In the tabernacle. And you remember how the book of Exodus concludes, the glory cloud descending. And so glorious is it that, that the priests who are serving there, they can't even serve, right? The glory of, of, of God overflows the tabernacle. Well, what I want you to notice again is that the, the theme that we mentioned earlier about divine initiative and human obedience, right? In a sense, we have it repeated on, on, on a fuller stage, right? Obedience in Scripture and covenant obedience is ultimately about worship, right? It's about offering our lives to God, and that's what the tabernacle is all about. Well, how does that relate, how is that all tied together in, in this theme? If you remember, it, we said that the first time you have the covenant formula, I will be your God, where does it come? Genesis 17, the Abrahamic covenant, remember that? Okay, it comes at us again, in the book of Exodus, unsurprisingly, within the context of the Mosaic covenant, with now the extra part, and you will be my people, because they're now a people. And actually he says in chapter 6, I'll take you to be my people through the Exodus. Okay? But, but here, here's what I want to show you. Look, look at Exodus chapter 29. Verses 44 and following. 
I'll consecrate the tent of meeting in the altar. Aaron also and his sons I'll consecrate to serve me as priest. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. What does Leviticus 26, 12 say? I will walk among you and be your God, and you'll be my people. That's the essence of the covenant. God with his people in the same place. What you see in this text, though, is that, that promise, that central covenant promise, God with his people in a place, a holy place, where, where he bestows his blessings upon them, where he manifests his glory to them, where they respond and offer themselves to God and worship. What you see here is this is the goal of the Exodus. Okay, listen. God didn't redeem Israel just so they didn't have to experience the misery of slavery. Right? How many times do we think of salvation in that way? It's a get out of hell free card. Now it is. Praise the Lord, right? Okay, but that's not the ultimate purpose of redemption. What is it? It's the covenant. And specifically, it's that covenant bond between God and his people, which is centered in the tabernacle and later the temple. Now, here's the problem, and you know it very well. No sooner has God entered into a covenant with Israel that Israel breaks the covenant. And it's to remember Mount Sinai and the golden calf. Like, seriously, he literally just gave the Ten Commandments, and they're breaking the Second Commandment. Okay? And you know about numbers and the, the wilderness wanderings for 40 years and everything else. And, 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 and even before they go into the land of promise, the Lord says, and Moses says the same thing, he says, you know what? You're a, a stubborn and rebellious people. And you always have been. And so I know that even before you go in the land, right, when you get there, you're going to be unfaithful. And all the covenant curses that are also in the Mosaic Covenant, those are the ones that are going to come on you. Not the covenant blessings, because you're unfaithful. It's going to be covenant curses. Well, this is where the Davidic covenant comes into play. So you remember how the book of Judges concludes? There, there, there are two things. Judges is not a happy book either, right? It's not like, yay, Israel! Finally learned the lesson. Right? It's a, it's, a, it's a downward spiral of unfaithfulness and increasingly just horrific events happening. And at and, and the end of the book of Judges, the author gives two reasons for this downward spiral. One is everyone's doing what is right in his own eyes. In other words, they're trying to be their own god. They're trying to be their own a law unto themselves. And, 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 and that's resulting in, in just a mess. But you remember the other reason is there's no king. So you remember the book of Ruth. The, the book of Ruth begins by saying these things happened in the days of the judges. You're like, okay, that's cool. And then you go to read on, and it's like, oh, this is what a beautiful love story. <laughs> right? And then how does the book of Ruth conclude? Do you remember? There's a genealogy. And whose genealogy is it? David. David. Now, why does the book of Ruth begin telling us these things happen in the, day of the days of the judges? Because God, it wants to show that God in the background is doing something. Okay? And, and, and what already the story is saying is that the solution to this covenant crisis between God and his people, God is good, God is faithful, but his people are unfaithful. The solution somehow is going to be tied to the king. If we had time, we'd turn to Psalm 78. Look at it later. Psalm 78 is one of the psalms that recounts the history of Israel. And it's one of the psalms which basically says this. God was faithful. Israel is unfaithful. And it just repeats incident after incident where God is faithful and Israel is unfaithful. Okay? And again, this is, this is, this is, this is, a, this is a, a very uh, a malfunctional, dysfunctional relationship that God has with Israel because of her sin. The climax of, of Psalm 78 is God found David who was shepherding his father's sheep. And he set him as a shepherd 
over his people. And so like the book of Ruth, Psalm 78 says the solution is a Davidic king. And so with the Davidic covenant, you, you, you've got a number of themes, and again, they're all mentioned in some ways. But you have uh, three heightened themes that, that, that I want to mention very briefly. If Exodus is about bringing Israel out of Egypt, like God, way back with Abraham, brought him out of his father's house. What's the other side of the promise God made to Abraham? To the land which I will show you. <coughs> right? Well, God's bringing Israel out of Egypt. It's ultimately about ultimately bringing them where? Into the land of promise. Well, it's under the, the, the Davidic kingship that that promise is finally kind of, at least in a preliminary way, secured. Through David and through Solomon. Okay? Israel enters into their inheritance. It's also through David, and this is where the Davidic covenant comes in, that the Davidic king is given the task of, of, of one very important building, which is what? The temple. And again, this is connected with what? The theme of place. And so the king is presented as not only the kind of mediatorial solution to the, the problem of the relationship between God and his people, He's also presented as the one who really secures God's presence among God's people through the construction of the temple. And thus, he secures their place in the land. Now, this is why David is associated with the writing of the Psalms. Why is it? Well, the Psalms are the songbook of Israel. Well, what's Israel's chief end? To worship the Lord. Okay. Who is this chief song leader in Israel? David, the king. And when you read the books of Kings and Chronicles, which both recount the, the story of David and his offspring and later kings, the ultimate measure of, of these kings is not how many buildings did they build. In fact, you'll often read the stories and they'll say, go read about that elsewhere. The Chronicles of so-and-so. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> the main way these kings are measured for their success or failure is how do they behave in relationship to the temple and how do they behave as the worship leaders of Israel because this is the purpose of Israel as a nation it's a kingdom of priests but what do we know about the Davidic kingship ultimately it blows it as well right? <coughs> and it's very interesting and again we, were, we didn't have enough time to do it but the story of scripture is a covenant story. When the narrator in 1 Kings is describing the ascent of Solomon and the glory of Solomon's kingdom, he's describing the, 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 the breadth of the land. He describes the wealth of the people. Everyone's so wealthy. Everyone's a property owner. Everyone dwells under his own vine, under his own fig tree, it says. And I mean, think everyone owns vineyards. That's pretty wealthy. But he also says a few things. Solomon has a lot of gold, Solomon has a lot of horses, and Solomon has a lot of wives. Now we read that and we think, well, probably the wives thing is not good, but maybe that's Old Testament, so it's okay. <laughs> but the, with like the horses and the gold, we're like, oh yeah, that's great. Solomon, glory, glory, great kingdom. Except this. In the Mosaic Covenant, when God gave instructions for the king, he says the king needs to do one thing. He needs to write the law. Okay? And, and, and the idea is that the king is to be the first law keeper in Israel. The success of the nation depends upon it. And then there are three things he shouldn't do. Don't amass wives. Okay, we get that, right? Um, don't amass gold and don't amass horses. So here's the thing. If this is a covenant story, when the narrator is telling us that Solomon, right when things start to be, they seem like they're going so great, he's amassing horses, gold and wives. What do you think the author is saying? This isn't going to go well. And of course we know it doesn't go well. And so what's the result? Ultimately, not only Israel, but her kings are kicked out of the land, right? As the Mosaic Covenant said they would be if they're unfaithful, right? And ultimately what happens to the temple? It's destroyed. Now, here's where we come to promises regarding the new covenant. And, and we'll just be brief here because we can pick these things up next time. There are three images that the prophets use to describe how God in the New Covenant 
is going to bring this covenant story like to its ultimate resolution and fulfillment. There's an image of a building, there's the image of a plant, and there's an image of a marriage. You see the first two in Jeremiah chapter 1. When God calls Jeremiah, he says, your job is to tear down and to build up, to pluck up and to plant. And again, you think of the metaphors there. Tear down, what do you tear down? A building. Build up, what do you build up? A building. Pluck up, what do you do? Pluck up a plant. Plant a plant. And the point is this. Israel is the building. Israel is the plant. God built something, but as a result of Israel's unfaithfulness, as he warned in the Mosaic Covenant, he's going to tear it down. He's going to bring all the covenant curses upon it. God planted something. In fact, it grew, and, and, and one of the prophets says that its glory filled the earth. The birds nested under its branches. But because of Israel's infidelity, and because of the covenant curses that God pronounced in the Mosaic Covenant, he's going to pluck up that plant. And it says, Psalm 80 says that wild boar is going to come and eat its fruits and it's going to be destroyed. And he says, one day, I'm going to rebuild the building that I've torn down. I'm going to plant the plant that I once planted. Marriage. The marriage of a dream. You see this in a couple of places. Hosea, but one of the most profound places in Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16 paints the entire history of God's covenant with his people as a marriage. And what he says is, you were born Israel. And when you were born, nobody cared or about you. Your parents actually left you naked, bloody, like in the wilderness. But I found you. And I loved you. And I nurtured you to health. And, and you actually grew up. And then I clothed you and I adored you and, and, and you became a queen in the midst of the earth. But here's the problem. After you gained this beauty, after I married you, you began to trust in your own beauty. <coughs> and you began to, to play the role of a prostitute. And he actually says, you're actually worse than a prostitute because usually prostitutes at least make money out of the arrangement, but you paid your lovers. And he says, so because of this, because you, you have forgotten where you came from, you forgot the, the grace by which I called you back when you were nothing. You forgot the, that all the glory you had came from me. The curse is going to be upon you is, is I'm going to bring your lovers against you in judgment, these nations, and they're going to strip you bare, and they're going to beat you. It's actually one of the most graphic descriptions of, 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 of what God uh, it's one of those graphic ways of describing the covenant curses coming upon his people. <coughs> but then in the, in the concluding verses of Ezekiel chapter 16, he says, Nevertheless, even though you did not remember, I will remember. I will remember the promises I made way back here. The promises which I confirmed when I walked between the pieces of that animal and said, What? Let this happen to me if I don't keep my promises. And I'm going to renew the covenant. And I'm going to make an everlasting covenant. And I'm going to marry you. And I'm not only going to bless you, I'm going to bless your, your pagan sisters. But I'm going to be blessed in this covenant with you. And so the new covenant talks about something that really, from a natural perspective, is seemingly impossible. Think about that. When you tear down a building, you might build something new there, but you can't build it out of the, the, the pieces that were torn down. Right? When you pluck up a plant, something new might grow there, but, but the plant you pluck up, it's gone. When you destroy a marriage, with part from rare exceptions, right? it, you can't put the pieces back together again. Except God can. Right? And, and, and here's where we get back to, to the billboard. Right? Jesus is the answer. To, to what question? To what problem? Uh, to, to use Ezekiel's uh, question from, from later on in, in Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? In other words, can something that's impossible with human beings happen? Can a building that's been torn down be rebuilt? Okay? Can a plant that has been uprooted once again flourish and its branches fill the earth? Can a marriage that has ended be restored? Now, just to, to give a precursor for next time, 
What the New Testament says is what? Yes, it can happen. And of course the answer is Jesus. Briefly, three, the three images. Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 12, the last week of Jesus' ministry. Jesus comes into the temple. He does a very strange thing. He, he turns over the tables. He, he quotes two Old Testament passages, one which speaks of a judgment coming on the temple, one which speaks of judgment on the rulers for excluding the Gentiles. And you remember as he's, he's coming out, the Jewish authority says, by what authority do you do this? Well, he doesn't answer their question directly there. He, he, he asks them, well, what about John the Baptist's authority? Basically, he realizes they're just trying to catch him, and so he, he turns the tables over them. But then he tells a story at the beginning of Mark chapter 12. He tells a parable, and this is, I sense, his answer to the question. This is a man planted a vineyard. And he, he set some of his servants in charge of it. And when the time for bearing fruit came, he sent a servant to gather the fruits. And those who were working the vineyard, they said, oh, let's kill him. And they killed the servant. They said, I'll send another one. They beat him. And he sent one after another, after another, after another. And, and, and the tenants, they kept keating, killing and beating the servants. So finally, the man says, I'll send my beloved son. Surely they'll respect him. But what happens? They said, ah, this is the heir. Let's kill him, and the vineyard will be ours. And so it says they, they beat him, and they kill him, and they cast him out. And you remember Jesus says, what do you think the owner of the vineyard is going to do? Well, what's fascinating about that is at the very conclusion of that story, he quotes Psalm 118, which is the same psalm that the crowds sang when he entered Jerusalem. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But he quotes a different verse in Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Cornerstone of what? The temple that God's going to rebuild. But how is it going to be rebuilt? He, as the cornerstone, has to be rejected before he can become the foundation stone. And when Jesus says, I will build my church in Matthew 16, he's talking about rebuilding the people of God. What about the vineyard? John chapter, uh, chapter, chapter 12. Remember what Jesus says? He's, he's again, his public ministry is coming to an end. He's about to go into the feral discourse was just with his disciples right before his crucifixion. And he says this interesting thing. Unless a, a kernel of wheat falls from the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it does, it does what? It bears much fruit. Okay? How, how, how can this, this plant that's been torn up, how can it once again become fruitful? Because Jesus the kernel of wheat will fall on the ground and die. And it will become fruitful again. What about marriage? Ephesians chapter 5. Remember how Jesus is described? Right? As the bridegroom. As the husband of his church. And what does it say that the bridegroom did for his bride? He gave himself up. He offered himself. He died for her. To what end? Ultimately, to reunite her to himself, to present her to himself holy and blameless. And so, Jesus is the answer. Okay? But he's the answer to a story that we can't fully understand unless we understand the covenant of grace. The promise is made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The promise is made to and through Moses. The promise is made to David. The promise is made ultimately in the context of a new covenant, where God, after he has brought the curses upon his people, torn them down, he's going to build them up. After he has uprooted them, he's going to plant them. After the marriage has come to an end, he's going to remarry them forever. And the coming of Christ is the solution to how all of these things are going to happen. All right. Time to, to conclude our discussion, but I want, to, I want to leave you with two thoughts. Okay? Two thoughts. One, everything we've said in the Old Testament tonight, about the Old Testament tonight, is, is not a matter of, of reading someone else's mail. Paul, at the end of Romans chapter 4, after he has been talking about Genesis 15 for a long time, he says, these things were written, they weren't written for Abraham's sake. In fact, why would they need to be written for Abraham's sake? He was there. He knew God was going to keep the promises. He knew God justified him. What does he say? They are written for 
our sake. Why is that? Because we're the offspring of Abraham. And all the promises made to Abraham, all the promises made to and through Moses, all the promises made to David, all the this is our, these are our promises as well. Right? Paul in, in 2 Corinthians 1 20 says, In him, in Jesus, all of God's promises are yes and amen. Okay? Second thing is this. That last scene in, in Genesis chapter 49. I mentioned a couple things about that last scene, describing the, the promises made to Judah. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Right? He's the one who receives praise and worship from Jews and Gentiles. But it also says something else about the, this lion of the tribe of Judah. It talks about his wealth. And it says he ties his foal to the vine. It says his, his teeth are as red as wine. He says his clothes are laundered in wine. And, and, and to make a long story short, the point is he is very, very wealthy. Okay, He's so wealthy, he has so many vineyards, that he parks his car, his donkey, at the vineyard, he washes his clothes in wine, and, and every night at dinner he drinks wine, that's why his teeth are red. Okay? Well, one of my favorite songs, which is based on, on a poem by Samuel Rutherford, okay, describes the relationship that we have to the one described in Genesis 49. The covenant at his heart is what? It's a relationship. It's a bond. In the, language, in the language of Song of Songs, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. That's the essence of the covenant. Everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to me. Everything that belongs to me belongs to Jesus. Well, Samuel Rutherford, reflecting on that language, and reflecting on the imagery of Genesis 49, he says this, and this is part of the hymn that is going to be sung at my funeral if my kids follow my order. <laughs> oh, I am my beloved's. And my beloved is mine. He brings the poor, vile sinner into his house of wine. I stand upon his merit. I know no other stand, not even where glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. What's the purpose of the covenant that we might learn to praise God? Why did David write the Psalms that we might learn to sing his praise? Okay, ultimately, we praise God, but we praise the lamb. We praise the lion. We, we praise the one who brings poor, vile sinners into his house of wine. And we have confidence that all of it belongs to us because he belongs to us. All right, I'm out of town, time. Let me pray. And then if you have questions, I'll be happy to talk to you afterward. afterward. Father, thank you for your word. <coughs> thank you for an amazing love towards sinners that you have exhibited. When we were weak and without strength, you gave your own son to be our brother, to be our husband, to be our redeemer, to be our head. We thank you that he belongs to us and that we belong to him. May we receive him by faith. May we look forward to his second coming with a greater hope. And may our lives be characterized by a love that is freely expressed on our lips in songs of praise. And we ask it in his name, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.